And this is what it comes down to. Um, spoiler alert. Uh, change and breaking through plateaus comes down to one thing and one thing only. And this is sort of part of my philosophy in life right now. It's a principle of voluntary discomfort. You're going to have to be uncomfortable if you want to make any progress whatsoever in anything. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 59 of the Andrew Deitch podcast. What's up, everybody? Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, Hopefully, you guys are having an awesome week. I'm feeling pumped. Uh, I'm trying to upload this before heading to the gym this morning, so hopefully... I can get this out in time, but uh, if this is your first time joining me here, my mission is to bring you transparent, vulnerable, and valuable conversations uh, with the most fascinating people that I know, and hopefully I can bring some entertainment and value to whatever you're doing right now. Maybe Maybe you're driving, maybe you're cleaning your house, maybe you're walking your dog, cooking, maybe you're at the gym, heck. Maybe you're doing your taxes. I don't know. Maybe you're just hanging out and relaxing. But in any case, I know that there are a million other things that you could be listening to right now. So thank you, thank you, thank you for choosing to spend some time with us today. Um, But uh, let's just jump into the show, shall we? Uh, Wow. I have a special and value-packed podcast for you guys today because my guest is my friend Jack Morrow. And some of you guys might know Jack. Uh, I have known Jack since middle school uh, where we used to run cross country together and we were in Boy Scouts together. And um, to be completely honest, he was always a very uh, skinny, scrawny, kind of, you know, kind of nerdy looking dude, to be honest. Like, but talk about the pot calling the kettle black here, because Lord knows I had my awkward and small phase as well. I was a dork, but um, he also uh he he always had really big goals, and I remember him uh excelling in many things. But after middle school, he went out of state for high school, so I didn't really you know keep in touch with them that well but we remained friends on Facebook Facebook was just kind of starting so everyone was friends with everybody kind of and uh but but nothing really more you know and I remember seeing him post some pictures of him at the rowing team at his um high school and then when he got into the Naval Academy um no big deal uh he posted some pictures where I remember seeing some physical change but you know nothing really to write home about you know still pretty skinny he did put on some muscle I remember but you know he pretty much just had like regular posts and of course when you're thinking Naval Academy you know putting on a little muscle didn't seem anything out of the ordinary basically what I'm trying to say is nothing he ever posted um really really like stood out to me as anything crazy but that all changed a few years ago um, because all of a sudden, just scrolling through my newsfeed, I see these pictures of Jack like flexing on the beach or something, and my immediate reaction is just like, "Wait, what? That's Jack? Wait, that's Jack Morrow? No, it can't be. It, I mean, seriously, Jack looked like he had doubled in size. He looked like the freaking Hulk. It was insane. Like." I didn't even know a transformation like that was possible, but there he was. And I'm just like, all of his friends from back home are probably wondering how the heck he did it. So a couple years have passed. Jack has gotten even stronger and bigger. So of course I had to have him on the podcast so y'all could hear his story. And not only has he made a huge physical transformation, but he's a really, really smart um, guy. He's very successful and, uh, he lives out in Southern California. So I was really glad to catch him over the Thanksgiving holiday. And, uh, we talked about all kinds of stuff, including his kind of origin story growing up in Boy Scouts and school, his path to the Naval Academy, his introduction to powerlifting and fitness and much, much more sweet, sweet, juicy content. But, um, I want to thank Jack again for being on the show and providing so much awesome value um, to everyone listening. So without any further ado, please welcome my friend, Jack Morrow. All right, dude. We are live. Live in action. Boom. 
I don't know how to start podcasts. It's always a very awkward, <laughs> awkward thing because it's like all of a sudden we were already talking and then, and then all of a sudden we're on the record. It's an artificial start. Yeah. <laughs> very nice. Well, um, just to give people some context, we're sitting here in, in Jack's parents' basement here in, in Georgia. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty okay basement. I mean, It's a pretty legit basement. By basement, I mean, we call it the terrace Ooh. to class it up a little bit. Wow, the terrace. But uh, it's a basement at the end of the day. Truth be told, it's a basement. <laughs> well, it's... I mean, I guess it's kind of a basement because you've got the open back, too. Yeah. That's the weird thing about in in Georgia, we always call it a basement, but it's like it has a back door. It just means lowest floor. It yeah. doesn't actually mean like floor zero. concrete underground bunker. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We're not in a concrete underground bunker, unfortunately. Yeah. As cool as it would be. Yeah. Be bad for acoustics. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I was earlier before this, I was just kind of like thinking about the show and thinking about what we were going to talk about and all that kind of stuff. And I was in... Weirdly enough, I was in the shower, but that doesn't really matter. Okay. But um, but I was thinking Glad about you were thinking like, about me in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was thinking about I was like, when's the last time I've even seen Jack? I don't think I've even hung out with him or seen him in like probably seven seven years or eight years maybe. Must have been, yeah. Yeah, because I I mean I think the last time I saw you was probably at some kind of Boy Scout function or something like that, or maybe yeah. At church if it was or well, if it was a Scout function, it would have been at least a decade ago. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Yeah, because my last my last scouting related stuff was uh, was in eighth grade. Was in eighth grade. Yeah, but I was thinking, I think maybe when you were uh, in high school, you might have came back for yeah. like one or two things, I've come like back a, a bunch. an Eagle Scout ceremony or something like that. Some so event, yeah. something like that. But besides that, very little contact. But, yeah. But um, yeah, I was kind of just mentioning. Like, I feel like we've known each other from you know, the middle school kind of yeah, age. long time. And then we didn't really see each other for like a decade. And then you kind of popped up in my Facebook. So we've been Facebook friends. Yeah. And then, I, I mean, I, I feel like I have a very similar reaction as more as other people <laughs> that knew you from back home. And we're just like, holy crap, Jack got huge. Like that was, <laughs> I mean, I feel like that's, I feel like that's the general reaction. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it is funny. So for, uh, for those listening, um, <laughs> uh, freshman year of college, um, I was, uh, I was five foot eight, uh, 125 pounds and I was a crew coxswain and a crew coxswain is the dude in the back who coaches and steers for correct rowing. techniques for rowing. Um, and so that little guy's got to be, you know, little so that the rowers don't carry on too much uh, too much extra weight. So anyway, I, I love that, and, and we can, of course, talk about crew if you want, but I was doing that for about five years. Anyway, uh, after freshman year of lightweight crew in college, I said, you know what? Um, I think I saw the movie like 300 or something, <laughs> and I was like, yo, I got an idea. Uh, and, and I decided to start lifting. Um, honestly, I started lifting just to get... Uh, just get some respect. Yeah. So skinny guys get no respect. Yeah. And, uh, I can definitely relate. Yeah. I was always a pretty small dude. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I said, you know, let's, let's give it a shot. And so I started lifting weights and turned out it was pretty fun. Uh, fast forward now, um, I'm five, eight and 200 pounds. Um, and, uh, still pretty lean, still pretty lean. So I ended up, ended up getting really competitive with the lifting, uh, getting into powerlifting, um, now I just compete in deadlift, um, but oftentimes because I moved away from Atlanta for high school in Chattanooga and then for college in Annapolis, oftentimes when I reconnect with folks, I haven't seen them in many years, especially mm -hmm. when I come home. And people people do this double take like, whoa, you know what happened to Skinny Jack? And it's funny because people you changed, bro. Yeah, it's like you changed. Uh, no, pe pe people people. Um, it's funny because people can be really uncomfortable with change. Definitely. Um, sometimes people don't like to see other people make progress because it makes them look at themselves critically. Uh, and so I haven't gotten any like, you know, uh, there's been no lashing out or anything yeah. over, over my... Uh, Who's this I, guy think he is? Yeah, yeah. Mostly people are like, wow, that's really cool. But it is interesting to see the way people react because... Um, I think I think uh, when anyone changes, it, it makes people look at themselves and ask themselves how much they've changed. So mm. um, that's an interesting yeah. way of thinking about it, man. Because I I think you're totally right. Because I mean, 
there's a part of me that when I, you know, when I see someone that makes this like crazy transformation for the positive, you, you have to kind of think back and like, damn, like how much progress have I made in this amount right. of time, you know? But I mean, also it's important to, to, to realize, okay, there's been a physical transformation. Um, people make physical transformations all the time for better and worse. Everyone's changing all the time. I do believe in that. Uh, but what you're just seeing is the external. So how much has changed on the inside? Well, you know, 10 years ago, when I last was in regular contact with the people in Atlanta, I was into nerdy stuff, comic books, sci-fi, uh, reading science textbooks, putting everything in Excel spreadsheets. Guess what? I'm still doing that same stuff. That is totally <laughs> still who I am on the inside. I might have changed on the outside, but trust me, I am still just as much a nerd as I always was. It's kind of funny. I, <laughs> I, I think actually, like after after you know, getting embedded into a, like the fitness world a little bit more, I realized that a lot of these guys that end up getting really big are tend to be on the nerdy side. Yeah, they because, intellectualize it. Because they, number one, probably because of what you were saying before, it's kind of like I was a skinny dude, it's I want to respect. <laughs> but then also you have this element of you've got to apply some science and some actual, yeah, a little bit. you know, you've, you've got to figure out what your diet needs to be in order to grow, but also not just get super overweight. And you've got to figure mm -hmm. out, you know, your schedule and your lifting and all that kind of stuff. It, it kind of, you you kind of have to be sort of this, a little bit nerdy in a way about it. Yeah, there has to be there has to be a balance of brute effort and planning, right? You can't just haphazardly make your way to improving. And don't get me wrong, it's not like ten years ago. I was like, here's the idea, we're gonna do this, and then ten years ago, ten years later, it's like, great job. Yeah. It's more like at at every couple month intervals, I'm trying to figure out what I have to do to make progress. It's interesting because. When we talked before we started the show, I was like, well, what questions are you going to ask? And you said, well, I'd like to keep it conversational. And I thought, son of a bitch, how am I going to, how am I going to prepare? Cause I like to prepare for things. Yeah. Um, but if there was to be any sort of a lesson associated with this episode, um, I think the pe things people come to me most often with is, uh, it boils down to the question of how do I change? Right. Cause they see me as having changed at least physically a good bit. People either want to, uh, improve their lifts or lose body fat or get larger legs. <laughs> they come to me for that one because I got funny legs. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, at the end of the day, people want to know how, how to change. Uh, and, and oftentimes that question is born of frustration and not having changed for a very long period of time, uh, being stuck on plateaus. And I was talking to a good friend of mine recently and he was saying, that that's kind of my thing is breaking through plateaus and changing when the odds are stacked against changing. Uh, and so if that's something you want to, you want to get into how yeah. I approach change and ensuring change occurs, uh, that's something I feel like, uh, is probably my niche yeah. within this world. Well, let's talk about that. But before we jump, jump into that, cause that that's like super interesting because a lot of people definitely, I think feel like they're in a plateau right now. That's that's very relatable feeling. Most people at any but, given time. Yeah. yeah. And you um you kinda touched on this a little bit. We were talking about, you know, growing up we were in Boy Scouts and you were uh you went up to Chattanooga, right? For yeah. high school. Yeah. So just to give people kind of a take back moment, because I think a lot of the people that know you now out in California, you mm. probably haven't heard like the the origin story of Jack Amaro. Yeah. So if you it, like just to give people kind of a a quick, I don't know, uh, hi not history lesson, but you know, oh, oh, like man. just kind of the 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 go back because the, sh the short brief history of time. Yeah. For Jack. So you were born in Georgia, right? No, oh, I was wow. born in Lexington, Massachusetts. Oh wow! So uh, <laughs> that was my girlfriend in the background cheering. She's a, a Bostonian. So, um, so my full name is John Parker Morrow, um, and I was named. John Parker Morrow after Captain John Parker, who's the captain of the Lexington Minutemen in the American Revolution. He, he said, uh, do not fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. And there's a statue of uh, Captain John Parker in Lexington. Anyway, so I was named John Parker Morrow, Lexington, la la la. Moved to Georgia shortly thereafter. I don't remember Boston, uh, Massachusetts at all. Uh, I need to go back there, but and you anyway, have and you have four siblings three, three siblings? sisters three sisters two older sisters one younger sister 
beautiful, wonderful, loving family. Grew up here in Georgia. Uh, spent most of my childhood outside, so I think that was kind of formative for me. I caught lizards a lot. Liked being in nature. Didn't have very many friends, so I was a friend of the animals. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I do, painfully I, true. No, seriously, I, I spent a lot of time outside. Um, didn't watch TV. Didn't play video games until much later. Was that like your parents' thing, or like? Yeah, they. Oh uh, no, they probably wanted me to have friends. Um, <laughs> no, but, no, but did they? But did they uh, not want you to play video games? And yeah, watch TV? they were really s- smart about that. To be honest, they didn't yeah. not let me have any consoles or TV shows or anything. They just they were like go outside. So when I got to watch TV is when I, we had the stomach bug. Then we got to drink Gatorade, which we never did anyways. Um, <laughs> eat saltines and watch TV if we got a stomach bug. So that was kind of a weird highlight. Um, twice a year or whatever, uh, but mostly <laughs> I was outside and so. Then in middle school, I um, I got into Boy Scouts uh, through my dad. He was a he was a scout. He was an Eagle Scout, um, and so I connected with the Boy Scouts. That was awesome because that helped uh, deepen and reinforce some of the love of the outdoors that I already had from mm-hmm. growing up. Uh, and it gave me a chance to have some brothers because growing up with just sisters. I uh, lacked that mm. uh, that brotherhood, and so Boy Scouts was phenomenal for that. Uh, and your dad was the the scoutmaster, so he, he was not only was it like that he got you into it, he was also like the main leader. He was like he was like driving it, which was kind of a double edged sword. It's a question of you know nepotistically did that make things easier for me if anything it probably made things harder i think i would agree i would actually agree i (laughs) think me to a really high standard and Uh, i think your dad realized that and i don't think he ever you know he definitely didn't cut you any slack as far as uh, boy scouts as 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 far as (laughs) if he was going to enforce something for everybody it was going to be enforced just as much Uh, for you doubles doubly so so. yeah Uh, but boy scouts was a great experience um and then I went away for high school. So I went to an all-guys boarding school called Macaulay. And what was the re- initial reasoning for that? Reason was I wanted to get into the Naval Academy. And Macaulay gave me the best opportunity to do that um, because um, it was it, Macaulay's a great school. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's They offer a lot of APs and varsity athletics and whatnot. It's all boys, so I could focus. <laughs> um, and it, it turned out... Uh, to work really well. So when I was at Macaulay, I got into uh, Lightweight Crew, and Lightweight Crew helped me get into the academy, as did some of the other APs and stuff. But when did you, just, like you said, you wanted to go to the Naval Academy, and your your dad went there as well, right? My dad went there as well. Yeah. So was it, do you think it was that impl- implanting of your dad, like, wanting you to go, or did you actually want to go? I'm not did... sure I ever had a choice. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no. I, uh, it's just, so the way I think about it now is this, right? I didn't really entertain any other options. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could easily have played out that I showed up for the wrong reasons, and it, and it would have backfired. Luckily... I might have done. I might have gone to the academy for the wrong reasons, but stayed for different ones mm. and enjoyed it and valued it for different ones. So it kind of worked out that way. Yeah, but when you, like you said, you were going, you know, in like seventh and eighth grade, you'd already kind of decided that you were going to Macaulay because mm. you wanted to go to the Naval Academy, sort of. Or well, your that's why I got of... into Scouts too. because yeah. I know being an Eagle Scout would help me get into the academy as well. Yeah, it was something a box. That's so. Check. It's so interesting because I mean, like a lot of high schoolers, they spend so much time figuring out what type of college they want to go to and all that kind mm. of stuff. But it was like for you, it was okay. Seventh and eighth grade, we're going to Macaulay. So then, and we're going to join Boy Scouts, and I'm going to get my Eagle Scout. All leading up to this culminating moment yeah. of me getting into the Naval Academy. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It. I'm a, I'm a serial planner. I'm very forward thinking. And let me tell you, that's not uh, an inherently good thing. I think, <laughs> well, honestly, I think that you can um, deprive yourself of joy in the moment by being so fixated on what's next. Mm. You can uh, lose your sense of enjoyment in being in the present, not to get too frou-frou with it, but there is something to be said for just kind of chilling where you're at and enjoying it. Definitely. And I don't think I'm not one to say that, um, you know, satisfaction is death. And if you're happy where you are, you're never going to make progress. I say bullshit. You can you can be proud of proud of how far you've come and satisfied with that, and still get better. Mm. I mean, those are not mutually exclusive states of mind. So, uh, 
But anyway, yeah, I had known I wanted to go to the academy for a long time. Uh, paternal influence on that one, yeah, pretty strong. Definitely. However, um, <clears throat> like I said, it ended up working out. And probably what I'm most grateful for is at the academy. That's where I uh, discovered lifting. So, like I said, I wanted to, uh, after freshman year on Larry Creek team, I wanted to get uh, get a little stronger, get a little bigger, uh, see what lifting was all about. Seemed to be the kind of the way to go. And it turned out to be this this awesome thing that I really loved. Um, How did you, like you said, you saw the movie 300. You were kind of thinking, like, I want to get some more respect. I want to get bigger. Yeah, like, it was kind of like that. It was like a combination of things. And so did how did you join? Did you just go to the gym and start lifting stuff, or did you like f- find some people that knew more than you, or how did you get into that? Great question, because there are people out there who are total beginners, and it's, it's a tough question. You know, where do I start? And I often kind of ask myself, you know, if I were to start fresh now, what would I do differently? Mm. I gotta say, probably nothing, just because it's all worked out. That I wouldn't want to risk it not working out. No pun However, intended. Yeah. <laughs> hey. So. Um, so what I did is, and this is in line with how I've been about a lot of different topics, I'm an obsessive learner. When I get into something, I want to do a deep dive and learn as much as possible about it, uh, get as good as possible at it as you know as I can, and then find something new. And lifting is the only thing I have in my life right now that I haven't moved on from yet after mm. having learned everything I can about it because I'm, well, I'm still learning. I'm still yeah. getting stronger. Um, but what I did is I, I went to YouTube. And learn some stuff from uh, Scooby, Scooby's Workshop. If you type in Scooby's Workshop, it's this bald dude who's like 50-something. And he's pretty jacked. And he has some very practical, no bullshit advice about getting started with lifting. So he was helpful. Scott Herman Mm -hmm. uh, is this dude who's got a fitness channel. um, And his stuff is pretty good too. Good technical instruction. And I read T Nation, Elite FTS, Bodybuilding.com. Got into all that because truthfully, I didn't have too many mentors early on with lifting. Not too much external influence. I didn't have a coach or anything like that. It was mostly self-taught. But by self-taught, I don't mean uh, self-made because I had people who helped me. And uh, anybody listening to this, you might have heard. Tim Ferriss's interview or, or a conversation with Arnold Schwarzenegger. There's an essay by Arnold Schwarzenegger on Tim Ferriss's website called I Am Not a Self-Made Man. Worth the read. Long story short, he, he claims that he's the product of a lot of powerful, useful, personal influences in his life, and I, and I take the same approach. I think it's um, arrogant to do th- anything you know otherwise. But yeah, um, That's kind of how I got started. It was a little bit of self-taught. Then and, when I connected, and you were still in at Macaulay at this point, or had you? No, this was at the this was at the academy. So there's this one guy at Macaulay. His name's Frank Kaler, and he was my first introduction to lifting. He was like the the no neck, thick football dude, and I was a scrawny kid. And for whatever reason, he wanted to help me um, learn a bit about bit about weightlifting. And so I got in the gym with him a couple times. Didn't see as much progress up front, but that was kind of the initial exposure. Gotcha. And, and then, was it kind of like you said, it was like this culminating moment all the way, or like I said, really the culminating moment up until this point where you got into the Naval Academy, was it almost like at that point you, you were an Eagle Scout, you had the, you went to Macaulay, all this stuff. Was it kind of like you were just a shoe in for the Naval Academy or were no, you kind of nervous about no, it? No, no, there was nothing shoe in about me getting into the Academy. And this is a really competitive congressional district. And that's part of the process is a congressional or senatorial nomination. Really? And yeah, huh. it's like... It's part that you don't realize. You can have some of the best stats, but if you don't have the best stats for your congressional district, you can lose your spot to someone else. Wow. Uh, Do you think that? Um, I mean, if I mean, obviously it all worked out for you. But what would you? What would have happened? Like, I'm sure you played it out in your head a bunch of times. Like, I what would, would have, have gone to Embry Riddle Aeronautical University and reapplied a year later, and a year later, and a year later until I got in. That's the truth. Um, because I was pretty singularly focused. So the the thing is, I mean, I, I built it all up in my head, like, oh, we got to get in the Naval Academy. And yeah. then I get in, and it's kind of like a, whoa, now what? I didn't get this far. Like, I was just trying to get in, and now it's I got to figure out what I'm going to do with it. So, um, so lifting became kind of the next focus for me, uh, next long-term focus. And I ended up getting onto the powerlifting team because I figured out 
pretty quickly that I had above average strength. And by above average strength, I only mean that for my body weight, I was pretty decent out the gate with deadlifts specifically. Mm. Squat wasn't great, bench wasn't great, they still aren't. Um, but I just knew that I was, I was like okay at deadlifting uh, for, my, for my weight at the time. And that was enough, I guess, to get a seat on the bus to hmm. uh, join the team. And before that, you were doing rowing. And I remember back in middle school, you're doing like cross country. So this is the first time you've ever like yeah. done any kind of lifting. <laughs> for... Yeah. I mean, I was, I was like a runner, uh, tried wrestling, got my ass kicked because I was, well, I was kind of a pussy at the time, but <laughs> I also was like 10 pounds lighter than the next lightest guy. And he was like the state champion, this dude named Michael Hooker. And he just tooled me repeatedly. <laughs> and I was like, I am out of this sport. This sucks. Uh, <laughs> Um, but anyway, so you got to yeah. the Naval Academy, joined the powerlifting team, yeah, and just kind of didn't ever look back. And I was like, I was like, let's go. So uh, I, I I connected with a lot of like-minded folks who wanted the same thing as me, which was get as strong as possible. And we formed this group of of uh, of lifters that was just really powerful. Like the, the names that come to mind are Ben Ettinger. He taught me more than anyone else has about powerlifting because he powerlifted in high school. So he had a couple years of experience and the dude was freakishly strong, uh, also wicked smart. So Ben Ettinger taught me uh, a ton. Ben Graveline um, was great, great training partner. Christian Johnson, Carter Byrne, who's the current uh, team captain of the Academy Powerlifting team. He, uh, he, he worked with me a bunch. And we all got stronger together, and it was that it was that thing of having a common goal. Um, so the goal was powerlifting. It wasn't ever bodybuilding. It wasn't ever. No, yeah, that's interesting. That's something that um, has been kind of a a challenge for me since the start. So I think uh, I think if the academy had bo- a bodybuilding program at the time, I would have joined that. Hmm. And if they didn't have that, but they had Olympic weightlifting, I would have joined that. And then after all that, if they had powerlifting, I joined that. And that's all they had at the time was just powerlifting. So I joined it. Turns out I like powerlifting more than any of the other ones. But the next best one is probably bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, and this is a big part of my philosophy, I believe that it's possible for anyone who has the willpower to look good and be strong. This idea that the two are mutually exclusive and that you have to get fat to be strong or you you know have to use machines to look good and can't really screw with heavy weight or you'll get injured. Um, I just don't buy that. I mean, I think that's such a limiting way of thinking. There's too many examples of people being successful at both bodybuilding and powerlifting, whether they compete in both or not. There's no reason you can't look good and be strong. And I think, uh, I think that's worth pursuing. I think it's a healthier way to approach it, especially when you see how some powerlifters look it's like come on like yeah you really believe you got to be that fat to be strong it's bullshit <laughs> you know, is, so, but, why I, mean, I think everyone wants to make excuses right like everyone wants to sure because so they can justify what they want and i think one of the biggest that people will make that are not necessarily outside of the fitness community but maybe they just got into fitness and they look at somebody that's made massive strides and they'll say like oh well i just don't have that same body type or like Oh I'm yeah! Just, oh, this is my I'm favorite. Just, you're Ready? an endomorph. I'm an yeah, ectomorph. Yeah, that's my like, favorite. Oh, I'm a, I'm an ectomorph. I'm a, I'm chronically skinny. My metabolism is too high. So what do you say I'm to eating, that? I'm, I'm eating six thousand five hundred <laughs> calories a day, and I, I, I'm still one hundred and thirteen pounds. All right, look. I mean, I get DMs like this sometimes on Instagram, uh, which is great. I mean, I love coaching. If you listen to this, you want me to coach you. I do coaching services online. It works great for the people who decide they want to work hard and not make excuses. But when people say this shit, I'm like, what are you even asking for my help? If, if you believe if you believe that you're just screwed genetically and that you're chronically skinny and you have high metabolism and you have all these all these limiting beliefs and you want my help, what, am I going to go rearrange your genes? 
What am I gonna <laughs> What am I gonna say that's gonna change these conditions that you've already just bought in so hard on? Uh. I don't buy that shit. And if if you want to make progress, this is for anything. If you want to make progress, step one: don't internalize all these limiting beliefs about your potential to make progress. That's like saying, ah, God, it's just. It's like saying, I can't run. I, I wish I could sprint 100 meters, but I can't run. So, I mean, what am I going <laughs> to do? I just can't. It's like, well, maybe if you thought you could run, you could start making progress. So what I do say, that, and I try to be nice um, yeah. because I, I want everyone to make progress and I'm not interested in just shutting people down. But I would say, well, first of all, be realistic. The natural fluctuation in metabolic speed between it, outside of having you know actual metabolic disorders between like an ectomorph and a mesomorph and an endomorph or whatever you're talking like plus or minus up to 300 calories a day on the basal metabolic rate bmr okay so that's like one sandwich if you're telling me that your your metabolism is so high you just can't eat enough to gain weight you're literally a sandwich short okay Look at look at the look at the science online. I don't have all these things on hand, but um, the whole ectomorph, mesomorph, endomorph thing is kind of bullshit. Okay. Yeah. So what is that? Bullshit. Like, is it a real thing? Because I mean, I think you can look at these. Like, if you you know look up what is an endomorph and you see this body type, you can picture like what those. Yeah, people Yeah, you can picture look people like. you know who like fit the fit the mold and stuff. Um, is it real or is everyone kind of the so, same? And it's all like yes, and, yes and no. I think lifestyle decisions, especially like coming from childhood, lifestyle decisions play a big role in why you look the way you look. Mm. I was underweight because I was high activity uh, and I just didn't focus on eating that much. But my mom also fed me really, really, really well growing up. Home cooked meals all the time. So I give her I give her all my medals for anything I win uh, because I give her the credit probably for um, sweet genetics and because uh, my mom's beautiful and uh, for feeding me good food um, because I think that does make a big difference. But if you're skinny, maybe you just didn't eat enough growing up or you're too high activity for what you're eating. If you're fat, maybe you ate too much growing up and maybe you got the same genes as the next guy. I don't know. I do know that all that stuff is kind of an afterthought and if you're trying to make progress, focusing on the past and why you're the way you are right now ain't gonna help you that much. Mm. Um, So to the person who comes to me and says, oh, I'm chronically skinny and I eat 6,500 calories a day. I'm like, first learn to count because 6,500 calories, you know how much that is? That's stupid. You're coming up on Michael Phelps' diet. That's, yeah, it's a Michael <laughs> Phelps, Brian Shaw shit right there. Um, like, it's going to be eat, painful to eat 6,000 calories. You don't calories. eat 6,500. Unless you're like chugging coconut oil or something. Yeah, you're, right? You're not like, ingesting 6,000 yeah, calories. Yeah, so first of all, get realistic with how you count your calories, if counting calories is the way to go. And for the record, I'm not big on counting calories. I don't think... You got to do that until you get to a really elite level or if you're so structure oriented that that's what it takes for you. So counting calories, it's an option. And if that's what you need, fine. Um, do, you need to, do you need to count calories to make progress? No. Um, so I'd say get realistic with that. Uh, but just understand that and this is what it comes down to. Um, spoiler alert. Uh, change and breaking through plateaus comes down to one thing and one thing only. And this is sort of part of my philosophy in life right now. It's a principle of voluntary discomfort. Mm. You're going to have to be uncomfortable if you want to make any progress whatsoever. In anything. In anything. This, is, this stuff applies outside of lifting, but applies very literally in the fitness world. Voluntary discomfort applies to a wide range of, of, uh, of areas. Um, I am not the type to wax philosophic about, oh, the sacrifices I make for this sport. Like, it's a hobby that I do voluntarily. I'm not suffering whatsoever in doing this shit. Um, and some, some of the, like, the top bodybuilders, like Kai Green, I love you, Kai, if you ever listen to this, but he's like, oh, you know, the sacrifice and there's so many things I've given up for this. It's like, look, dude, you could just do something else, you know? Like you um, could go, you could have an off week for a while. And nobody's going to notice. Yeah, I know. But, but there are things, and I, I hate to use the word sacrifice because it is so watered down already. Um, there are things you have to not do sometimes in order to make progress. For example, I don't generally party. Okay. My generation and my peers, 
don't really get that, they don't really like that. Guess what? For me, that's what I gotta do to make progress. I know that if I stay up late and drink, my sleep's gonna suck, my diet's gonna suck, my training's gonna suck for maybe a couple of days, and I'm just not willing to do that. Except for like once or twice a year, I'll like have a rager or whatever. So, um, but I'm just- Everything in moderation, that including moderation. Yeah, exactly. That can't be part of my routine um, to party. Uh, but getting back to voluntary discomfort, look, I'm a believer that, that, that pain makes you better, especially pain that you understand, you enter into voluntarily, and you endure of your own volition. That's useful pain. Um, and there's also kind of a difference between pain and discomfort, too. It's like, yeah. you know, sometimes it's like something is like painful and you're, I mean, because pain is just the body's response to something that's like, yo, be careful, like something bad's happening. Yeah. Um, or change is happening. Yeah, there's this, um, so, so Tony Robbins, who most people know, uh, if you don't look him up, uh, but Tony Robbins makes a very useful distinction between uh, suffering and pain or suffering and discomfort. Mm -hmm. Suffering is an emotional response to pain. Suffering is a choice you make emotionally and how you're going to respond to something your body's experiencing. I don't suffer when I'm lifting. Am I in a lot of pain? Oftentimes, yes. My back hurts all the time. Shout out to everyone talking about my rounded back. Congrats, it's rounded. Um, <laughs> you know, the blood pressure that blows out blood vessels in my eyes. Uh, yeah, that hurts. My thumbs from hook grip. Yeah, that hurts. It's all pain. Am I suffering? Absolutely not. Um, in fact, I'm, I enjoy it. I, I masochistically pursue that a little bit because, <clears throat> and this has always been the case for me, I know that if I'm willing to go through more pain than the next guy, I will get stronger than he will. Mm. Plain and simple. If you're willing to put up with more pain and if you're willing to let go of things that the other people will not let go of, like drinking or whatever, guess what? You're going to make progress faster than them. Uh, and for me, I'm kind of an all or nothing kind of person. Like I'm all in or I'm not. I can't really do moderation very well. Um, that's what works for me. That's what works for me. So voluntary discomfort's a big thing. That's the thing for diet. Like I've gained a lot of weight. I, sh I should not weigh this uh, weight. My body doesn't want to weigh what I weigh right now. The discomfort there is I have to eat past being hungry. And I know a lot of fat people out there are like, oh, must suck to have to eat so much. Well, guess what? You're not know? eating Cheetos, though. Yeah. I mean, I'm, well, sometimes I sometimes, eat Sometimes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but, like, I have, to, I have to eat more than my body wants to eat. That's not comfortable. Uh, but I do it voluntarily because I know it's, you know, for a good cause. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. Well, um, so another thing that uh, I think we were talking about this a little bit earlier too is like, what's the kind of final point? Like earlier, I was like, well, were you into bodybuilding? Were you into powerlifting? Because I mean, the from my understanding, the goal of powerlifting is to lift as much weight as possible, right? Like yep. that's the final goal. Like I want to yep. lift this weight in the air as heavy as I can. Bodybuilding, on the other hand, is focusing purely on the physique and the aesthetics of your body, it, yep. they don't care anything about the numbers of yeah. what you're lifting. Yeah, so. And do you fall like, cause, cause the other thing that you were saying is like you don't, you don't wanna be that fat guy that's just the power lifter that only mm, cares yeah. about the number cause you also do wanna look good. You also do care about what you're putting into your body. Where does, where do you find that line of like what you're where's actually, the where's the goal, you know? Like, yeah. is it just lifting or is it also the health and wellness aspect well let of, me just let it. me just cover something really quick here about the health and fitness health and fitness are two separate things mm. okay my dad is an ironman triathlete very healthy guy okay you cannot find a healthier uh 50 something year old on the planet dude looks like he's 30 um is guys guys crazy healthy uh he's also really really fit he's a great swimmer cyclist doesn't run anymore but anyway all that's well and good um there's a certain point in most sports but particularly in the iron sports of weightlifting powerlifting bodybuilding a strongman and i guess crossfit but not really um <laughs> there's a certain point at which health and fitness depart there's a fork in the path and you say, do I want to be healthier or do I want to be better at this activity? Mm. And I am beyond the point of that fork and I have chosen performance. Okay, so that manifests in a number of different ways. One, it's not healthy for me to be this weight at 5'8". Being 200 pounds at 5'8", it's not horrible. 
Um, but if I plug it into a calculator, I'm obese, right? Um, it's not healthy on my joints to be lifting the way I'm lifting. It's not healthy for my back, for all the hitters out there. Is this good for my back? Shit, no. I'm not doing it to preserve my back or to be a healthy old man. I'm doing it to move a lot of weight right now. And maybe that's short-sighted, but also, you know, I'm close to my athletic prime and I'm going to I'm gonna see how far I can take it. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So, You're trying to push the limits of what you can do. Right, right. So make no mistake, there is a... De- there's a point of departure between health and performance and you gotta, you'll, you'll know when you're there and you'll make your decisions as you make them. Um, so to be perfectly clear, health is not one of my goals. Mm. Now health is a, uh, necessary side goal in order to do what I'm, what I'm doing as long as possible. It's, I don't want to call health a necessary evil, but, uh, if I'm not healthy, I won't be able to do this stuff for very long. So I have to take care of my body in order to keep doing this. That's kind of how that one shakes out. Um, There's a very like balanced, interesting way of looking at it. I like how you said there's like that fork in the road Mm -hmm. where you have to choose between performance and health. Because a lot of people don't, they've never come to grips with that. And they don't even think about what that goal is. Most people don't make it that far. Mm, That's Um, true. Yeah. And what's really funny, and it's not funny, it's sad and pathetic. But people think they're at that point sooner than they are. Uh, and what that means is they'll get to like, say they're like a, like a, like 185, 175 pound person and they're getting to like a, uh, I don't know, let's say a 405 deadlift, which is a big benchmark for most people. Uh, 405 is a lot of, 405 or 500 is typically most dudes like big goal for deadlift. And those are respectable goals. It shows you definitely put in work. Um, so they'll get, they'll approach that point and they'll think that, Oh, I better be careful with my back or, or, Oh, I don't know if I can spend any more time in the gym. And they think that they're on the verge of compromising their health for the sake of performance. It's like, dude, you are not even close. You are not even close to hitting that point yet. Trust me. You could push yourself a lot harder and not be worried. It's like the people who are like obsessed with like, Oh, I can't overtrain. Your body can put up with a lot of bullshit. You mm-hmm. trust me. You're probably not overtraining. Um, you know, if you were, because you'd be in the hospital, but overtraining, I don't want to say it's a myth, but it's the last thing most people got to be worried about. Okay. So, uh, don't you be worried about overtraining. Okay. That's not a, no, you're probably under training. Most people are probably under training. Um, so anyway, when it comes back to bodybuilding versus powerlifting, what's, what's the goal? Um, good question. I want to deadlift 700 raw in my lifetime. Um, that means no belt, no assist. No oh, no, 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 no. Belt is okay. 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 Uh, raw means no suit. Okay. okay. So there's, there's like lifting suits, um, mixed bag. People, people talk a lot of shit, whatever. It's how I came up in powerlifting was with the equipment. So what is, how does the suit exactly work? Cause I've seen people wearing these, but I don't exactly understand what it does. So it's a, it's a, it's a compressing material. Think of it kind of like a canvas almost, but it was originally designed so that old people could lift for longer without risking their joints. Hmm. So, but it quickly became leveraged to make things easier. Uh, and so, for example, with deadlift, basically it's a, it's a compressing kind of material. It makes it harder to reach down for the bar so that when you can get to the bar, there's some natural pull kind of off the ground. Basically, deadlift suits only help off the ground. Hmm. Um, and uh, Yeah, in my experience, they only help off the ground. Squat suits and bench shirts are a little crazier, okay? So because you can load the eccentric portion of the lift going down with the squat, uh, you can get really stiff squat suits that help you squat more. So I, the most I've ever squatted raw was probably like, I don't know, like 450, 485, something like that. I squatted 628 pounds in a suit, okay? <laughs> In, That's in, insane. In college, yeah. Um, I, squatted, I, I squatted 628 pounds in a suit. Uh, and so it makes a big difference, all right? <laughs> now, with deadlift, I don't know how much I get out of a suit. It's probably like 30 or 40 pounds, okay? Because mm. so anyway, all it really helps is just that few couple few inches off the Just a little bit off the ground. And gotcha. it depends on your stance and all sorts of other factors, too. Um, so I want to deadlift 700 pounds raw. 
that's the body, that's the powerlifting goal. Uh, bodybuilding, I just want to keep looking like I lift. To be honest, um, I'm not as interested in competing in bodybuilding. If I did, I would do classic physique. But I just know that if I went down that path, uh, my strength would fall to shit. And I care more about my strength than I do about my aesthetics. Um, so I, I think if there's balance in anything in my life, it would be between aesthetics and and uh, and powerlifting and quick plug for my coaching services. Uh, that's how I write my programs is bodybuilding and powerlifting. I think if most people are not far along, uh, far along the path enough to where they got to really pick between bodybuilding and powerlifting and they can benefit from both, from both styles of training at the same time, power building, power building for, for a very long time, they can get better at both of those things. Mm -hmm. And so, that's how I that's how I program things. It's it's powerlifting style main movements for squat, bench, and deadlift, and assistance work that you would normally only see in powerlifting programs. And then the back half of each day is like fifty percent. Uh, it's bodybuilding. Yeah, it's bodybuilding rep schemes and and uh, and exercises as many reps as possible. That kind of stuff. Mm, yeah, Not as much, more but... more like more volume and stuff like that. Isolation. I have no mm. problem using isolation machines. So many powerlifters like, oh, isolation machines are for pussies, uh, beach muscles. Blah, blah, blah. Well, <laughs> maybe you'd get a better bench if you did a little more tricep isolation work. Maybe you get a better deadlift if you worked some uh, hamstring curl. You mm. know, uh, I think I think training both in parallel has helped me. And of all the people I've coached along the way, they've benefited from both. Because guess what? It feels really good to look better and be stronger at the same time mm -hmm. and not have to pick. And I don't think most people really have to pick because most people just aren't far, far enough along yet to where they got to specialize mm. super hard. Um, Definitely agree. You know? Well, another thing that I was going to ask too about is uh, stretching and mobility and stuff because that's a, I oh, think yeah. that's becoming more of a uh not fad but like people are realizing oh. it's more important than it than it uh in the past or whatever or, or 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 people are just focusing on it more i feel like than they were in the past what are your views on it and what do you yeah. do as far as mobility first things first i think it's important okay um that comes back to health as an enabler for continued success uh you do have to take care of your body uh in order to keep lifting the way you want to or looking the way you want to and whatnot. You said fad, which is really interesting because I do think that stretching and mobility and that kind of stuff has been popularized to such an extent that some people are focusing a little more on that than on training their asses off. <laughs> and they're like, Definitely. oh, I gotta be, oh, my IT bands are so tight. Like, maybe I shouldn't squat today. Or sack up and squat and <laughs> deal with your bitch-ass IT bands some other time. Okay? Um don't let the stretching and mobility thing become such a focal point that you become like an expert in stretching, unless you want to be a yogi, uh, and, and still say your goals are about squat, bench, and deadlift. Okay, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, because you did Arnold use a foam roller? Probably <laughs> not. Now, do I use a foam roller? Yeah, religiously. I think it helps. Definitely. But, and, I, and I'll share my exact routine here. But, um, you know, these guys who've, been, who've historically been incredibly successful in the sport uh, of both bodybuilding and powerlifting, trust me, they didn't spend like, you know, two hours a week on mobility and all this other crap. Uh, those are opportunities for people in the industry to sell you stuff. And mm. that's all well and good. Some of their stuff is useful. And I've bought some of the stuff um, that I do find useful, like Mark Bell's hip circle for hip um, abduction and glute activation prior to squatting and deadlifting hmm. that i find useful okay i haven't the seen that what hip, is it hip circle the hip circle it's a uh stretch elastic fabric band you put around uh the bottom of your quads just above your knees you take a mild squat and then do some like side stepping does it go around both of your quads yeah, it's, or just around... a loop. it's just a circle and you put it and you put it uh, it like keeps your legs together and you you yeah whatever just i've seen some people hip do, circle, yeah. using those in the gym yeah yeah they're not Oh, God, my mic came off. Um, they're not all branded hip circle. Mm. I'm going to reattach my mic. Uh, they're not all branded hip circle, but I like to support Mark Bell because I think he's done a ton for the sport. Uh, anyway, so with, with the mobility thing, just if, focus on methods that are going to make you stronger first. And then as you need to, just knowing your body 
keep up with the injuries and all that other stuff. Mm. Don't don't let the car get in front of the horse yeah. with the whole mobility and stretching thing, injury prevention. That's all important, and it's really important for me now because I'm reaching a point where I get injured sometimes, mm-hmm. and I have to stay ahead of it, and that's all well and good. Also, know your own resistance to injury. I'm a generally pretty injury-resistant person, so I ain't got to worry about it as much. Some people get snapped up all the time, and they need to drink some milk. That's fine, and maybe they should be focusing a little more on the injury prevention stuff, but you only got so many hours in the day, and you got to be smart about how you spend it. Mm-hmm. So all I do for stretching mobility and that kind of stuff, I have the same routine for every single lifting day of the week, and that is... Uh, take some pre-workout, uh, which I honestly think helps with mobility and stuff because you get more blood flow. Um, mm. Roll out your back. Use a stiff, stiff foam roller. And I'm talking, if you can sleep on it like a pillow, it's not a foam roller. I'm talking <laughs> like if you can just get a PVC pipe, use that. Uh, and I roll out my whole back. Um, I'll do from my upper back. I'll put my arms around myself like a hug so I can kind of get into my mm. rhomboids and traps a little better. Um and then I'll do my lower back, of course, <clears throat> get my glutes a little bit. I will then sit in like an L sit and, and roll up my hamstrings on the foam roller. And then. Uh, Are your hands behind you in that yeah, point? Yeah, they're gotcha. just supporting like my center of gravity mm-hmm. by my hips and kind of rolling back and forth. A little awkward. I might get my calves if they're sore. Um, and then I'll flip and I'll roll my quads, put all my weight on my quads. Do you do both at the same time or like isolate each one? Sometimes I'll do both. I'll, I'll do uh, one at a time. Um, most of the time I just do both, yeah. you know. Uh, and I might roll on the sides to get my IT bands on the side of my quads, but not every time. Uh, and that's literally it for the foam roller. Okay, that takes five minutes. And then I grab two tens, and I've used two tens for years now, so it's not about you know ten relative to my strength. It's just use use tens, use tens. Uh, if you're a dude, use tens. If you're a chick, if seven point five. Seven point five, <laughs> fine. Um, <laughs> uh, and I I stand with uh, two tens that are either dumbbells or or or, uh, or plates. Doesn't really matter. I do ten lateral raises, dumbbell lateral raises. I bend over to forty five degree angle and do ten rear delt raises, which is basically like uh, to, to activate the back a little bit, the traps, rhomboids, et cetera. Uh, and then I stand back up again and do 10 front raises. And I put the 10s away. And I take one five, either a dumbbell or a plate, and I'll do right angle shoulder rotator cuff things, 90 to 90, elbow same height as the shoulder, 90 degree bend in the elbow from wrist level with the elbow to wrist stacked on top of the elbow. I'll do 10 of those on each side, one at a time. And that's it. That's what I do before every lift, regardless of whether I'm training delts or back or whatever. That's just the stuff I got to get warm. Warm up your back, warm up your shoulders, keeps me the most injury free. And it takes like eight, eight to 10 minutes. And if you beat up, do it for longer, whatever. It's literally that Do you do anything at the end or... At the end of your workouts? Well, yes. Um, So at the gym, no. But I'll come home and I have these inversion boots. Mm, Where you hang upside down? Called teeter ups. Yeah. Amazon teeter ups. I'm not sponsored. I don't have a discount code. Sorry. But (laughs) Amazon.com teeter ups. I learned about it from Tim Ferriss. So I like a lot. Uh, They're like a hundred bucks. Well worth it. So if you have a pull up bar or something at your house or you can get a door mount for these things, whatever. I have like a rogue rack at my house. Uh, And yeah, they're inversion boots. So you basically hook your toes there's a little hook thing on the boots to a bar and then you hang upside down and like initially it, it can be painful like a bat yeah um there's a stupid video of me on my instagram doing this eating uh, sour patch kids um <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna ask you about it stuff like the thing about the boots i want to ask you about sour patch kids okay. oh yeah <laughs> um so anyway what's great is it's decompressing your spine um because especially with with deadlift or other stuff your spine can get kind of bunched up I'm not a I'm not an exercise physiologist, but I do know that experientially decompressing my spine, spine using inversion boots has been helpful for me and for my teammates as well. So that's the one thing I'll consistently do after how exercise. Long, how long do you hang up sit down for? It's like five minutes. Gotcha. At most. Yeah. At most. And initially it's kind of painful, so you do a less. But um, that's some helpful stuff. Interesting. So, yeah. What's the deal with the Sour Patch Kids? 
delicious. Uh, <laughs> it's actually kind of a, a powerlifting thing. So anybody listening to this who's not been to a powerlifting meet, if you want to get some motivation in your life, go to a powerlifting meet. Search USAPL or USPA powerlifting uh, and your state and look at some events and just go to, just go to a meet. Uh, they're wild. Um, depends on the meet, obviously, but they can get pretty wild. And what you'll see is like all the lifters will have like sour candy. It's like, what the heck? You know, these people are like all focused on you know, being strong and buff and stuff. And they got this sour candy. Like, what's the deal? And people are always like shocked. Like at work, I'll be like eating candy and they're like, whoa, whoa, dude, like watch out. You might lose your abs. And it's like, I love candy. I eat candy all the time. Um, <laughs> and I could, you know, I can afford it and whatnot. But, um, the idea is quick sugars for energy. That's kind of the idea. Interesting. And sour is just the choice. Sour is a choice. Sour is a lifestyle. Uh, <laughs> no, I've always liked sour candy. It's um, a metaphor. Yeah, it's a little bit of pain with the sweet. discomfort, right? Uh, no, I like it. It's just pure. A little bit comfort. of mouth discomfort makes your mouth stronger. <laughs> yeah, something like that. It's yeah. So you'll see that at powerlifting meets. Um, and then also. Yeah. Um, What's the deal with, uh, in tons of your videos before you lift, you're like breathing into this oh, little tube. Oh, no, no. <laughs> so I'm not breathing into a little tube. It's a not capsule. Not breathing into it, but I... It's a capsule. Okay, so I get I, I get more questions about this than anything else on my Instagram. It's so funny. Like, I got started with the whole Instagram thing this year, and people are like, what's that stuff you sniff before your workout? What was in your mouth before that lift? What are you always... Are you doing drugs, bro? Yeah, is that crack? You're like, doing coke, bro? Which, anyone ask me directly if you're doing crack or cocaine, I just say yes, you know, because they're too stupid to <laughs> give the right answer to. But long story short, it's an ammonia inhalant, okay? You get them on Amazon. It's not drugs. I mean, technically it's chemicals, but it's not drugs. Um, you get them on Amazon, you get them at CVS, you get them... Is it like Vicks, kind of? Uh, we're going to say no. I mean, in the sense that you can smell it, yes. In the sense of what it does for you, no. Vicks is like, ah, oh, now I can sleep. Ammonia is like time to wake up. Mm. You know, ammonia, I've always said, is like turns you into the incarnation of Satan for like 15 seconds. Okay, you feel all the power channeling through your body for like 15 seconds. Basically, it's a central nervous system stimulant. You crack the packet, there's like a little tube inside the white packet, capsule, whatever, and it releases ammonia, which is like some kind of a chemical. Does it smell bad? It doesn't smell bad. It just, it's not how it smells, it's that it kind of burns your lungs and face. Um, <laughs> so it, it wakes you up. It gets in your sinuses. So like the best, the best comparison is wasabi. Mm, okay. If you put a big wad of wasabi, you know, coincidentally, I love wasabi too, but if you put a big wad of wasabi or horseradish, which is the same chemical in it, fun fact, um, most wasabi in the United States is actually made of horseradish. Check the packet. It's typically horseradish and, and blue and yellow dye. It's not actually wasabi. Wasabi is like an elusive root in Japan. Wow. Anyway, yeah, same thing. If Does you it compare was... the flavors, it's like wasabi and horseradish, same thing. Same wow. flavor. You're like, oh, I, I don't I don't like wasabi, but I like horseradish. You're a liar. You just, it's a different color. <laughs> you're anyway. just a racist. Is yeah, what you are. It's, it's a, you're, a, you're a spice racist. Uh, anyway, it, you know how wasabi kind of like lights up your sinuses um, mm. and wakes you up? That's kind of like what ammonia is. It's like mm. uh, it's a lot like wasabi in that sense. Interesting. Uh, it's very, very temporary. Yeah. It, I don't think it kills brain cells. I don't have any evidence to that. But um, if you sniff it in... Uh, it also like kind of clears your head. So you're not like, what if I miss the lift? What if, you know, what if they don't like me? Um, you, it just gives you a lot of confidence. I mean, for me kind of, it's like also like getting slapped in the face. You'll see that in some of my videos, people slapping each other, me slapping people, mm -hmm. uh, same kind of shock to the system, wake up, you know, get, get all the, all the muscles working together. That's yeah. what ammonia does. And, um, uh, if you want to know and how... And it'll to, immediately like snap you into that in the zone. You're ready to lift. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty in the zone anyway, but it helps. It's at an extra, extra level. So people ask about like, when is it appropriate to use ammonia? I use ammonia for lifts that are over 90% of my max, generally speaking. Um, and it does make a big difference for me. It's not for everyone. For some people, I've had plenty of training partners who felt like ammonia broke their focus and they couldn't stay technical enough to complete a lift. Hmm. There's a reason you see it in powerlifting more so than like Olympic weightlifting. Olympic weightlifting is 
highly technical to an extent. I would say powerlifting probably isn't. Powerlifting, you can kind of gut through some things. Olympic weightlifting, you got to be like really finessed with your technique. Ammonia would probably take you out of the zone for that. Mm. So anyway. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, that's what ammonia is. And uh, yeah, check it out. I mean, it's on Amazon. It's mad cheap. You probably won't like it, but. <laughs> but it worked for you. <laughs> But it works for me, so yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask you. Uh, so you went to the Naval Academy, mm. and now are you? You're you're graduated, right? You're done. I graduated. Um, when, and what, for those people who don't know, and for me even too, like, what is what does the Naval Academy mean in terms of like actually being in the Navy? Like, are you once you once you graduate from the academy, you receive both a an academic diploma and a military commission as an officer in either the Navy or Marine Corps wow. for, for the Naval Academy in particular. If you go to West Point, it's commissioned in the Army, Air Force, commissioned in the Air Force, blah, blah, blah. So that means that you then serve on active duty for uh, some period of time. Normally, it's five years. For me, I got out a little early. It was a medical situation. But you go into the fleet to serve as an officer, uh, which means basically you're kind of like a program manager, run operations, things like that. It's a leadership position, generally speaking. Um, so you kind of get to, because you were in the Naval Academy, not necessarily you get to skip certain parts, but you get like accelerated to a certain level. Your experience is different. So in the rank system, there's the enlisted ranks and the officer ranks, and there is your you start in either one of those two rank systems, and uh, as an officer, you start as an O one, and that's you're on the officer path. Generally, officers have uh, bachelor's degrees. Enlisted may or may not have bachelor's degrees, but it's not a requirement to go enlisted. A lot of people would enlist, say, out of high school is is an average case. Most people commission as officers either from one of the service academies, uh, an ROTC program, or what's called OCS, uh, Officer Candidate School for the Navy, or OTS, Officer Training School for Air Force and whatnot. So... Uh, you're just, there's just different roles for officers versus enlisted. If you look in, in the infantry side of things, um, basically enlisted, they get to do what we, you'd call like the Hollywood cool stuff, like snipers and stuff. If you're an officer, you're not going to be a sniper ever. You you might not even be on the front line. You, you, you often are, but uh, you might not be. You might be in some rear strategic capacity directing troops forward and whatnot. Um, whereas, uh, on the enlisted side, it's much more job and task specific. You tend to be more of a, a specialist or a technician on a system or a certain equipment or, or a type of mission. Whereas officers is general, it's more general capacity of leadership, putting the team together, executing the game plan, stuff like that. So, gotcha. uh, so that's what I got to do for a little while, which is pretty cool. Now I work for a, a veteran staffing firm. So what I do now is consult with companies on the best way to uh, attract, hire, train, and retain veteran talent because veterans represent a, a ever-refreshing talent pool of like 200,000 new veterans a year. And corporate America would love to hire veterans, but it's not as easy as you'd think to translate some of these military skill sets into civilian skill sets. So what I do is operate in a consultative capacity to help companies better understand how to hire veterans. Huh. And so that's something that uh, I really enjoy doing. And I know I'm helping veterans and I'm helping companies. They, they're getting the bodies they need for the jobs they have open. And the veterans are starting off in their first career in, in corporate America. So that's been, a, that's been a rewarding work. That's my day job now. And of course, on the side, I do as much coaching and lifting as I can because I just love that stuff. Yeah. Uh, if it paid the same, you know, I would be, I'd be super into that, but you know, coaching doesn't pay much and, and that's okay. I don't do it for the pay. I do it because, um, I like seeing people make progress. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, that's what I was going to ask you is like the, you know, cause we've been talking about goals and goal setting, mm. blowing through your plateaus and all that kind of stuff. Like ultimately you you realize that right now you're kind of in that prime of when you'll be able to lift the heaviest. And so yeah. in the future, you know, would you would you be going towards what what kind of I guess what are your goals like long term as far as like fitness and stuff like question. that I mean, and even just life because like you said you don't necessarily want to go 
coaching because the money's just not the same or whatever. You know, I, I'd love to coach in a more formal capacity and coach like a whole sports team or something like that or be a powerlifting coach. It'd be cool. Um, I think when I when I reach my athletic prime and and then I start to uh, – start falling behind that or when it's I'm not going to get stronger anymore and I'm talking like 15 20 years from now. Yeah. Uh the balance will just shift away from some of my personal athletics and more towards supporting other people's athletics. It'll be more oriented towards the coaching and team and team management and stuff like that. Um just because you know one person can't get any stronger doesn't mean they can't help other people get stronger. Mm. Um and and that's this there's this uh this is idea people have that just because um, you know someone else getting stronger that they can't like it's not a zero sum game. Everybody can get stronger at the same time, and it's not like you know there'll be no gains left for the next guy. Okay, yeah, everybody can get gains. It's up to you. Um, There's a limited amount of gains in this gym, and I want to absorb all of the possible yeah. gains. That's just not true, you know. So, um, so I want to help everyone get it's the gains. It's true. People have that weird mindset. Yeah, though. it's just they think like, oh, you know, f that guy because he's he's so strong and ripped. It's like he's not stopping you from getting strong and ripped. Exactly. Like, Only he, mentally, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It did. Yeah. So whatever. Um, so yeah. So that's that's the idea. I'd love to continue to coach um, because it's it's something I enjoy and. Regardless of what it pays, uh, that's just not why I do it. Because I feel like I didn't have as many coaches in a formal sense. I had peers that were helpful with coaching. Um, but I didn't have as many coaches in a formal sense when I started lifting. And so I try to provide that to guys who are where I was. Because I started as a really average uh, kind of athlete. And I think it took me a little longer to get decent at lifting because they didn't have a coach or mentor in the sport and a lot of mm. people a lot of people have misconceptions like one thing that i'm pretty clear to point out is people will ask me like hey what's your lifting routine well if i told you what my lifting routine is is that going to help you no it actually won't because um what i do now is based on my current level it wouldn't help you because what you need to do now is what I did when I was at your level. And then as you graduate from that, then you move into what I did after I did that thing. And for you, it obviously would be different. But but like if I were to train the way Phil Heath trains right now, am I going to look like Phil Heath? No, because I would need to put in the work that Phil Heath put in before he's put in the work that he's put in now in order to get to those levels before. So in terms of like just in the powerlifting context, program complexity, uh, my program isn't all that complex, but I do incorporate some training styles that uh, you don't need as a beginner and won't help you as a beginner. And our uh, weapons in the arsenal, so to speak, that I'd rather you save until you need them mm. to break through a plateau. If you're stepping in the gym for the first time and you're using bands and chains and box squats and safety squat bars, like, whoa, you just jumped to like stage three and you needed like establish stage zero first with some with some basic stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing I try to do when I coach is understand why people, I, I sent a questionnaire when I, when I coach people, I put out a questionnaire of what, how have you trained previously? How are you training now? Uh, what training styles most appeal to you, et cetera. So I understand when I write a program, um, if it's going to make sense for them, I don't want to write something that's uh, too low level. It's basically something I've already done or jump to a level of complexity that they don't necessarily need yet. Cause I write all my stuff from, from scratch and it helps to know sort of where people have been. So, um, don't ever ask, you know, what are the pros doing? Ask what did the pros do? Yeah. It's like, it's like, if you're trying to get rich, you shouldn't be looking at what Warren Buffett is doing currently. You should be exactly. looking at like what he did to get to where he was. Same exact principle. Yeah. Same makes a lot principle. of sense. But people don't want to look at it like that, you know. Well, they want to. They everyone, see these strong dudes and they're like, "Oh, that looks badass! I want to use chains and bands and like all the stuff you're it talking does about." Does look badass, but I mean, everyone wants a shortcut. Uh, fact is, strength takes a really long time to develop. Um, none of the other athletic skills take as long to develop as strength. Hmm. You can get flexibility, conditioning, skills. All those things come faster than strength. Strength is the slowest thing to develop. Uh, but the beauty of that is that it can be developed over such a long period of time and you can get stronger literally into like your forties 
There are people who are at the top of the game who are in their 30s and 40s, and they're still getting stronger. Uh, it's slow and requires a lot of patience, but the good news is it, there's there's more longevity in strength than a lot of people realize. That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. I definitely see some old guys in the gym still killing it. So. Oh, yeah, they're out there. That's legit. Yeah. Well, dude, I feel like this is an awesome uh, podcast. I feel like it's a good place to kind of wrap things up, but sure. if you want to... This is your time if you want to promote anything or shout anything out or anything else that you wanted to talk about that we didn't cover or anything like that. Well, I'll say I'll say shout out to the people who are just getting started because uh, I know where you've been. Uh, some people look at my Instagram now or whatever and they think like, oh man, you just you know he was born strong. No, it wasn't. I was born skinny and weak. Yeah, uh, and I worked for it. Um, and and you can too. If you want help, hit me up. Obviously. Um, you can contact me on my Instagram. I'm pretty active there. But at the end of the day, if I'm going to give anyone advice, it's uh, get uncomfortable. You get uncomfortable and stay there, uh, and you'll see you'll see progress. Know that most people around you are not going to want to see you make progress. Um, don't tell people about your goals because they will fight you tooth and nail to prevent you from getting them. Um, it's a little bit cynical, but it's the truth. People don't like when other people make progress because it makes them look at themselves. So, uh, keep your goals to yourself, work at them. When you start to see progress, you'll start to attract other people who want to make progress and maybe you'll have some friends change and that's fine. Um, but work relentlessly at your goals, reach out to people who might know more, whether it's me or anyone else do get a mentor. I think it helps. It could be someone at your gym. Uh, it could be someone online, whatever, uh, just get some, just get some help uh, from people who might know more, just so you don't waste your time doing stuff that um, that might not help you. As far as other shout outs go, uh, shout out to my mom. Thank you for the genetics and the food, Dad. You help with the genetics too, but Mom's genetics are pretty sweet. Um, <laughs> so shout out to them. Uh, shout out to my sponsors. If you want to learn more, just check them out on my Instagram. Uh, all good stuff that I believe in. Um, but we can get more into that later. So that's awesome, man. That's what I got. Sweet. Yeah. And if people want, I, you know, a lot of times people, especially me, when I hear something on podcasts, like, Oh, you know, I'll check out his coaching or whatever. But I, are you pretty transparent with pricing and stuff like that? Cause I think a lot of people are intimidated with like, Oh, well he's probably like 700 bucks a month or something. No, 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 no. So I, I do two different, two different models. Um, I'll do one time custom program writing where I essentially, uh, we'll write you a custom program based on your goals, your needs, your history with injuries, equipment limitations, how much time a week you have to train. I write those generally in four, eight, and 12 week blocks priced at 50, 75, and a hundred dollars each. Um, not too many online coaches will put their prices out there like that, but there you go. Yeah. Um, you don't then, have to listen to the entire podcast to get to this point anyway. So. Yeah, I mean, if you're listening, you're listening because you care, not because you want exactly. prices. But, um, and then I also do a, a model of, uh, of ongoing coaching, which is a little more intensive in terms of my approach with your diet, your training, progress towards goals. It's for people who want to compete generally. And that is 150 up front with $50 monthly after the first month. And that higher startup cost is because it does take me a lot longer to get figured out exactly what you need. But that is unlimited programs. As the program evolves and you need a new program, you do a meet and it's time to reset. We'll write something new together. Um, and is this pretty much virtual review. coaching or is it? It's all, it's all online. If you want to do in-person coaching and you're in Southern California, hit me up. We could work something out. It's not something I currently have a lot of time for. Um, also, if you're serious, we've listened this long on the podcast, uh, and you are serious about uh, deadlifting, and you live in Southern California, hit me up. Um, I deadlift at my house every Saturday, and uh, we have very limited spots. But if you're trying to pull something big, uh, and you want to come out, pull heavy, uh, hit me up. We can work something out. That's but, awesome, man. Uh, anyway, that's that's my deal with coaching. Like I said, doesn't exactly pay the bills, but... It's a way of filtering out people that aren't as serious so I can spend time with people who are trying to make progress. Uh, and what I've found is, is that that works pretty well. And the people who are invested up front uh, generally make some some sweet gains. So That's awesome, dude. That's what I got. Well, thanks, Jack, for being on the show. My and, pleasure. Uh, yeah, we'll talk to you later, everybody. All right. Take care, y'all. Boom. 
There you have it, folks. Another awesome episode in the tank. I want to thank Jack again for making the time to record with me and uh, to his family for letting us record at their home here in Georgia. They're awesome. And uh, after we recorded this episode, Jack and his girlfriend, Stephanie, invited me to go lift with them. And of course, I couldn't turn that down. I mean, come on. That was that was awesome, too. Uh, if you want to see a little video I made from that workout, I will be posting that on my Instagram story uh, in the next 24 hours or so. Uh, and of course it's an Instagram story, so don't sleep cause it's only going to be up there for 24 hours. But, uh, speaking of Instagram, make sure you go follow Jack. He has a huge following on there. Um, he's gotten a lot more active on Instagram over the past year or so. Um, his username is Jack the deadlift ripper. That's Jack underscore the underscore deadlift underscore ripper and If you can't find him or you don't want to type all that in, you can go to my Instagram and he'll be tagged in all of the promotional pictures and all that good stuff. But, um, now what? Are you sad? Are you sad this episode is over? Never fear. Never fear. I have a sneaking suspicion that if you made it all the way through this episode, you would probably also really enjoy listening to episode 47 called Progress Not perfection and that is with my friend Richard Corbett now Richard is an interesting dude he's a super talented artist Uh, he's a bodybuilding and fitness freak he's a college dropout and he's working through a massive injury that left him wheelchair bound Um, but because he's on this obsessive quest of becoming the best version of himself and smashing through his own physical barriers um, and mental barriers, uh, he's just a freaking awesome dude. And um, whenever I'm launching a new podcast, I'm always trying to figure out like, hmm, okay, what's the angle here? What story am I trying to tell here? And most of the time, it's pretty straightforward. Like, okay, with Jack, you know, he made this awesome physical transformation. Like, let's talk about that and, and all that. But like, with with Richard, it's like, oh, this dude's an artist. I'll pitch it as like an art podcast and then, you know, try to get people in art to listen or, oh, this guy's into fitness or, oh, this guy's an entrepreneur. But Richard is like all of those things. And I couldn't have been more pleased with how that episode turned out. Um, I think anyone who's a fan of my show is going to love that episode. But um, he's made some crazy physical gains this year as well. Um, I posted some pictures on my Instagram of what he looks like now. He's jacked. And again, that was episode 47 with Richard Corbett. Go check it out. Um, but if you hate people in wheelchairs and you don't and you don't want to listen to Richard's episode, <laughs> I know you don't hate people in wheelchairs. I'm just ma- messing with you. But if you want to listen to a different episode, I understand. No big deal. Um, I've got 56 other episodes about people who aren't in wheelchairs. So um, I think you'd also really enjoy episode 44 with my friend Anthony Assad. Anthony is a power lifter and a personal trainer as well. Uh, He's currently working on his degree in exercise science. And last year, he sumo deadlift, sumo deadlifted, I guess that's how you say, uh, 600 pounds at a body weight of 175, um, which is pretty freaking impressive. Um, And he has a huge passion for learning all that he can about longevity, health, and fitness. We, uh, like on this episode, you know, Jack was kind of talking about how there was that fork in the road between uh, longevity and health and performance. And it's kind of interesting because me and Anthony kind of talked about that as well. And um, I think you guys are really going to like that episode. I think I might have laughed harder on that episode than on any of the other ones. Um, We got into some hilarious subjects as well. So go check out episode 44 with Anthony Assad. All right, episode 60. Wait, did I just say that? Episode 60 is coming up next with singer, songwriter, recording artist, musician, Isaiah Ram. And I don't know how else to describe him because he just put out a full EP that he wrote, recorded, and produced all on his own. Very impressive stuff. Um, He played like all the instruments. He sang, he mixed it, everything. And the kid is only 20 years old. Crazy talented. I really like his music, and that episode will be coming out sometime early next week, hopefully. Um, That's all I got. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, If you want to support the show, 
please go to iTunes, rate it five stars, leave me a little comment in there. Um, I have a feeling that a lot of people listening right now are people that knew me and Jack from back in the day. And I'd love to reconnect with you guys. Um, If you want to shoot me a message, let me know what you think of the podcast. Um, I'm always curious as to who is actually listening to these. I just see numbers. I just see like, oh, great. 4,000 people listened last month. Don't know who they are. So I'd like to get to know you guys. I'm I'm not too busy. I'll talk to you. Um, And if you want to follow me, you can go to my Instagram um, AD podcast. That's where I post all the podcast stuff, but also you can just go to my website, andrewdeitch.com. That's A N D R E W D E I T S C H dot com. And you can find links to all my social media handles and accounts and all that stuff. But anyways, thank you guys for listening and I will catch you in the next one. You want my help? What, am I going to go rearrange your jeans?